So today we are going to talk about uh, coding best practices, C Sharp and .NET. And uh, this, uh, the examples that we are going to cover today, uh, it will be available to you uh, after this talk. So I will put it on GitHub and I, the link will be available to you. I will mention that at the end of the talk. And as part of the solution, uh, we are, uh, I have organized here four different projects. And we will spend about 10 to 15 minutes on each of these projects. And then towards the end, we can have Q&A, but, but also we can have Q&A after I cover the, each of these uh, projects. So I'll start with Nullable. So this is the first first project. Uh, I hope uh, you know you can see the, okay, I might have to increase the size of the font. We can do that. So here I can make it 150%. So this should be visible to everyone. So uh, everyone on board, uh, Ramanathan, uh, can we start? Okay. Ramanathan, can you hear me? Or anyone yeah, I can else hear can you. respond? I can hear you. We can start. I can hear you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So here we have a simple program. Uh, so the code here is mainly to demonstrate the concept of nullable. What is a nullable? It simply means an object which can be initialized to null. It can have so null is considered as a valid initialization or a value for that object. So that is how uh, we can define it as a nullable. So take a simple example in C program, for example, you can declare a variable and start using that variable, even though it may not be initialized. It is a dangerous practice, no doubt. Right, it is not recommended, but you are allowed to do that in C program. Now a compiler, C compiler might give you some warning saying that it is unsafe to use that variable without initializing it. Now, if you pay attention to those warnings, you as a programmer, you may remove those warnings. But how does it happen in C sharp? So here we have in line five, we have declared a very variable string name. And in the next line, we are trying to print. There is a method we have defined print name and we are trying to print. Uh, kind of print the value of that name. So let's see what happens in this particular case. So we'll try to build this. So it doesn't build straight away gives a throw the error saying that use of unassigned local variable name. So this is the first thing we have to bear in mind uh, when we compare C or C and C sharp. So if you are a C developer, you are moving to C sharp. C sharp is a little bit more strict in terms of uh, the way variables are initialized and how they are going to be used. So here it doesn't even allow you to get a clean uh, com compilation build because this variable is not initialized. It is complaining. But is this valid semantically? Semantically, it is valid because in my method that we have defined, we are actually checking whether it is null or non-null. So semantically, there is nothing wrong with this method. That is, this method handles an input which is both null as well as non-null. If it happens to be, uh, sorry, this should be null. If it happens to be null, uh, name is not initialized. And uh, otherwise, OK, let's keep it like this as original one, right? So either way, uh, this is how it is. So now let's initialize it like this. Now what happens? Can we compile it now? So you can see uh, the compiler has not complained. It has managed to compile it, but it is now throwing some warnings. And these warnings are also visible here. Now these things are underlined by a green wavy line. So what does it say? The, so as a developer, we have to make use of all these hints which come from the Visual Studio. So if we hover the mouse, we can see that converting null literal or possible null value to a non-nullable type. And this is where the uh, power of C sharp comes into play. We have declared the variable name as a string. But C sharp can also say that this string can be initialized to a null value. Now you see, once we put this uh, question mark sign, what we are saying is that name is a string, no doubt, but it is also a nullable. That means you can initialize 
name variable to a null value. And this is specified by putting a question mark next to the data type. So when we say string name, it means that name is not nullable. But if you say it is string uh, question mark, it means name now becomes a nullable type. So now we can safely initialize name this way. But still here we are getting a wavy line. There is a warning. So why is this coming? Because we have defined our method as print name, which takes an input argument as string, which in this case happens to be a non-nullable. So this can also be corrected. The arguments can also be nullable. That is the point uh, I want to make here. So now by defining both the declaration here as well as the method argument as nullables, now that warning has disappeared. Now we will get a clean build, a build without errors. Don't worry about this one. This refers to probably some other place. Yeah, it refers to a different part of the code. We will correct that later. But focusing on these two lines, we can see that now we have declared it as nullable and nullable can now be passed to print name. So if we run this program, what do we get? Let's return the from the method right here. Because Let's take a very simple example to begin with. So we are running this program and you can see name is it doesn't print anything because why we have initialized it to null. So obviously there is nothing to print. Now, of course, we can initialize it to something useful. Like this and then run it. Now it says name is not initialized. What is going on here? So this is the bug I was pointing out earlier. Because here. This should have been null. Name is not earlier. I had made this code in such a way so that for the earlier example where we have null, we get a different printout. For that reason, I had put it there. Now we have initialized it. Now let's run this again. So now we get the expected printout name is hello world. Now let's move on to the next example where instead of string, we take age as an example. So there's nothing specific that is going on here. So let's compile it and run it. So our only thing that we have changed is the data type. Right? We have changed the data type. So instead of this, we are printing this. Now the difference here is that age, uh, sorry, age int. Uh, so we are not talking about a string anymore. We are talking about a more primitive type called int. So int has a something called has value, which is available for nullables. So in this particular case, you we could write the code like this: age equals null. This is perfect code, which is similar to what we had here. But there is an easier syntax, which is you can use a property of an integer which is has value. So if it has value, it means it has been initialized. If it is not initialized, you print the statement. If it is initialized, you print the age. So let's run this. We have already run it. Uh, so now we can initialize a value and run it. So now it gives age is 90. Right, so if it is initialized, what will happen? Has value will evaluate to true, so it will go to the else statement and it will print. So this is a simple example of uh, nullables for strings as well as for integers. Now you may be wondering, can we look at a more complex example, more useful example? So let's take an example like this, where we have a function called get arc length. So what is get arc length? Uh, if you look at geometry, given a radius and an angle. Right, so you compute the length of the arc, which is defined by that sector. So the suppose the angle is defined in radians and uh, radians and uh, of course the radius is R. So then uh, the uh, arc length will be R theta. So that is what we are doing. We are multiplying R versus theta. Uh, here I have given the angle as uh, uh, this name. You can call it theta. Let's say. You can call it theta. 
because that is what it is. So the idea is we are multiplying radius with the angle theta and theta is in radians. Now the thing is, if you look at this, the way I'm calling this method, I am not passing theta. I am passing only the radius. So what does it mean? The second uh, argument is by default taken as null. And how is this uh, going to function? So the way this uh, method is defined or the behavior of this method is, if the angle is null, that means it takes a default of 2 pi. That means it computes the area of the whole circle. That is to say the circumference of the circumference of the entire circle. So that is how this method has been defined, get arc length. So typically, how would people write this code? The way they would write this code is, suppose I take uh, T as the new theta value, or I can even keep it as theta, no, no issues. And I will say, for example, I'll make it even simpler. If theta is null, then I will say theta is equal to 2 pi. Right? I hope everyone is following. If theta is null, that is in this particular case, I'm calling with a single argument. Second argument is null. Then I will take the default value of 2 pi. That is what I'm doing here. If theta is null, theta is initialized to 2 pi. Then I can go and compute the arc length which is nothing but radius times theta. So this is what it is. Return static double, okay. So why is this giving an error? Cannot implicitly convert from double, okay. So because this one is, so that we can easily fix because we are already correcting it here. So we can easily fix it by doing this. So that is also, it is an interesting error to keep in mind. So theta is coming in as a double, which is also nullable. So this error, what it is saying is because uh, C sharp is strict about conversion of types, it says you are returning a double. How can you convert from a double nullable to a double? Because now there is a potential that you can return a null because your input is null. But my code logic is such that when theta is null, I am converting it to a non nullable. I am converting it, it to a proper value, which is properly initialized to 2 pi. So, therefore, it is safe for me here to cast it to a double. So, now if I run this, what will happen? So, I will return here. And let's run this. So if I run this, even though I did not supply an argument for the second argument value for the second argument, I am able to compute the radius, uh, the arc length for a radius of two. And how did it work? Second argument is taken as null. And if it is null, I force it to a certain value. Now in C sharp, this code is considered a little verbose. So they have a shortcut called a null coalescing operator. And that whole code that we saw earlier, it can be shortened like this. So if theta is null, uh, you use the default value of 2 pi. If it is non-null, you use theta that is coming in. That is the meaning of this. And you will get the same result. Right? So the arc length for radius 2, you will get the same result. Now if you go under the hood, this is actually implemented like this. So what ha actually happens is it uh, what uh, nullable has a value called get value or default. And you can specify the default value. So this is our nullable. And if I do a dot, it will tell you what are all the methods which are associated with a nullable. And one of the methods is get value or default. So if theta has a value, that is you passing in a parameter for the second argument, then that value will be used. If a null is passed in, then the default value of 2 pi will be used. But even this is considered now verbose because now C sharp has introduced a shortcut, which is this null coalescing op operator. So 
so this is the correct way to write uh, code uh, in today's version of C sharp and dot net. Another uh, typical use case for this is let's say theta throw new something like this. Right? This is another typical use case where if theta is having a valid value, you proceed with the computation. Whereas if theta is null, you th throw an exception. So the se uh, semantics is the same. Here, if theta is null, you use a default value, 2 pi. Here is if theta is uh, null, you throw an exception. You don't use a default value. You say something is wrong in, in the way this function is called. So this is useful in uh, many other scenarios. In this example, this is not so useful because we definitely want to use a default value. But in other examples where you know you don't have a default, you want to throw an exception, this is the way to do it. So it's a handy shortcut, uh, this so-called null coalescing operator. Then the last example in this project is again pertaining to nullables. So we have here, so you can also do nullables with arrays. So we have a uh, array of strings and uh, the array is a nullable. So you can see here, we have initialized it to null and then we are checking what is the length of the array. So let's run this and it is uh, complaining. Names may be null here, as you can see here. But it is not an error because you don't get a red line. Instead, you get a green line. So that means it is compilable. So let's compile it and run it. Now this will not work. Straight away you get null reference exception. So what we are trying to do is we know we have initialized this variable names to null. So you cannot access certain properties of basically this is an array you cannot access length of the array when the array itself is not initialized, meaning that it is initialized to null. So you can't access the member properties of array. That is why we get got a null exception. Now, this is very common for people coming from C language because one of the problems in C is null pointer exception. Not only that, you don't even initialize it and start using the variable in C. That is perfectly allowed. Now, when this happens in C, you know, this va variable will be initialized to some arbitrary value. And when you run this in runtime, you may get a segmentation fault because now this is pointing to some location which is not under the control of the program. It can even be pointing into the kernel operating system memory. So that is the reason many C programs, they will throw a segmentation fault because you are trying to use a variable without initializing it or you are trying to use a variable after uh, when it is having a null value. Now C sharp protects us from all these problems by defining nullables, and that is the point of all these exercises. So now here, how do you prevent it? You can use this operator, which is question mark dot. So what this means is that if names is not null, only then you compute the length that is, you try to access the properties of the object. If names is null, obviously this will evaluate to false. And you will go into this else. So let's run this. So now you see there is no null reference exception. We got a clean printout saying that names array is empty. So these are so there are plenty of other things when it pertains to nullable. I've given uh, some of the things which are commonly used. So first thing to summarize, use the question mark to make it a nullable type. You can apply it to strings, integers, or even an array of strings or array of other data types as well. And these are some use cases in which you can use. You can use the null coalescing operator and this operator to determine. Uh, before accessing the properties, you can use this. So in the olden days, how would people do it? They would do something which is more verbose. This is how they would write the code. If names is not null, 
then you properly access properties of that object. Now this whole thing is shortened into this. So now we'll pause for some questions Q and A. So before moving to the next example, we'll pause for some questions. If anyone has anything to ask. So I hope it is clear. OK, so then we move on to the next project. Which is comparing arrays and lists. So let me compile this. OK, let's look at the program first. So we are taking a simple example, an array of bytes. And we are also initializing it like this. OK. So first thing you will notice that. There are. Uh, first of all, this is not. Uh, obviously we are inside a class and we are inside a method. And inside this method we are defining this. So obviously this is not a class variable uh, or a, a property of the object. This flags is nothing but a local variable local to this method. So now as a C sharp developer. This is a repetition. Already you are declaring that it is a byte array and here again you are declaring it's a byte array. So basically this can be simplified by simply saying this is var. And this is what I would recommend because uh, it makes it easier to read the code because it's a little weird to see the same thing appearing twice in the same line. Now var is a generic data type. I mean it's a kind of a placeholder. What the compiler will do is it will infer the data type from the context. Now here the context is very clear. You are creating a new byte array and you are providing some initialization values. So the context is very clear to the compiler. Compiler will immediately know that flags is a byte array. And so it is quite redundant to say byte array like this. You can simply say var. OK, so this is the first point I want to make, but this will not work here. Suppose I do the same thing here. Straight away I will get an error. I will even make this capital because we want it to be a different name from the local variable. So this is a valid declaration, but I'm getting an error. Why? Because this var keyword can only be used inside as a inside a method as a local variable. It can't be used for properties. So here we are forced to write it like this. So when you are declaring. Uh, as a property of a class, you have to do it like this. That's fine. But when we are declaring inside a method as a local variable, then you have that flexibility. So this method, this way of declaration is preferred. So let's come to our example. Example is very simple. We take a initialized byte array and we have a function just for our debugging purpose. We have written this function where we print. As a hex string. And then we have introduced a new uh, function here. I will return from here because I don't want the rest of the printout. We'll come to that later. So let's look at this method, what this method does. So it takes a byte array at the input. It loops through the array. And then what it does is the least significant bit, what we call as the LSP, it sets it to one. So it's a very simple code. It indexes into the array according to the for loop and changes the bit of the least significant bit. So with this understanding, let's run this code. And see what is the output we get and whether the output makes sense. So as you can see here, main dot flags. This is how we initialized it. Then inside that function we are printing. So after setting the LSB to one, you can see three has become uh, two has become three, four has become five, six has become seven, eight has become nine, A and B. B remains B because the LSB is already one. Same thing with D. D is what one one zero one. Uh, sorry, D is one. Uh, C is one. Uh, C is one one zero one. I think yes. So in this case, the uh, so the behavior is correct. 
Then we go back to the main function and you see in the main function also the LSBs are set. Isn't this a bit weird or is it a expected behavior? So what I have done, I have initialized this, passed it to a method. The method modified the least significant bits, uh, bits and then returned it. And then we are printing it here. Again, we are printing it and here also we see that it is modified. So from this, what can you tell about how uh, c -sharp passes? So you know from programming concept, you can pass to a method either by value or by reference. Everyone agrees? So from this behavior of the printout that we got, how does c -sharp pass? Does it pass by value or does it pass by reference? Anybody has an answer to this? By reference. Come again, I didn't get your answer. It's by reference actually. So the object is initialized with the new keyword and all the values are defined in that object. So now we are passing by yeah. Re uh, reference. Yeah. Yeah, so it is uh, imaginable to think that yes, because the reason is here it is initialized to 0, 01 and you are passing flags to the, the method. Method has modified it. After returning, you did not modify the local variable, but after returning, we find that the local variable has changed. So, based on that analysis, you are saying it is passed by reference. So, the answer, uh, so the answer is yes and no. You are but not uh, correct the way C, C sharp uh, defines these things. So let's look at some basic concept. Int, this is called as a value type. An integer is called as a value type in C sharp. Whereas an array, for example, the way we have defined it, it is a byte array. A byte array is called as a reference type. This is the fundamental concept that we need to understand. Integer is a very basic type. It is defined as a value type. Whereas a byte array, it is a reference type. Same thing if you take an object that is instantiated from a class, it will be treated as a reference type. So when you pa pass a reference type and uh, as an argument to a method, actually the value of the reference type is passed. So this is actually passing by value. So I will correct uh, Vijay here. What C sharp is doing is actually passing by value. But interestingly, because it's a reference type, the reference is passed. The value, uh, what we call as value is actually the reference. So the reference is passed. So it can be a little bit confusing at the in the beginning because if you are coming from other programming languages, you are only talking about either passing by value or passing by reference. But C sharp has one more abstraction. That is the type itself has a definition. Either it's a value type or it's a reference type. So byte array in this case, it's a reference type and you are passing it by value. But remember, because it's a reference type, any modifications which you do inside the method, it is it affects the caller's context as well because it is the value of the reference which has been passed into the method. OK. So I hope this is clear. We can have more discussion on this later. Now the problem with this approach is, I'll tell you what is the problem. OK, uh, maybe this is, no, that I'll come to it later, yeah. But let's say I do this. Let's say I have a requirement where I don't want to change this. I want to change only inside this. What would you do? Anybody? Typically what you do, you don't think about C sharp. Any programming language, I am passing it into a method and I want to make some changes inside the method. But I don't want those changes to be visible to the caller. It should be local to the method. So typically what would you do in this in a case like this? So in that case. Yeah, what will we do? We would take a copy, correct? Exactly, yeah. Right. So there are many ways to take copy. You can do dot. And I don't know. Uh, 
say there is something called clone, right? Creates a shallow copy of the array, copy to. So copy to is another way to do it. Uh, you can also, I think, give the index. It's a slightly different syntax. So let me just uh, put it down here. Clone, you would do it like this, right? Or probably not even this. Yeah, so you probably have to do it like this. Array dot clone and then flags, right? So something like this. And it is uh, uh, no overload method for clone takes one argument. OK, so anyway, I don't use this much because there is a much cleaner way to do it. The other method which I showed you was copy to. Copy to. Flags. So this is another way to do it. Exact syntax, I don't know. But the reason I don't use these syntax is there is a simple way to clone, which is this. So what we are saying, take flags as an array. And this is called like a slicing operator. So typically what we can do is we can slice, let's say from element uh, index one to element index five. You can take a subset of this and clone it. Right. So if I run this, for example, you will find the printout changes a little bit. So you can see here I am taking from one. Two, three, four, five, but excluding five. So that means I am taking four bytes and passing it into the method. That is what I have written here from one to five, but excluding five. Right, but if I want to clone the whole thing and you will notice that, you know, even though I have modified. The original byte array remains the same. Why? Because I have taken a copy. I have taken a copy simply by doing slicing. If I want the whole array to be copied, this is the way to do it. So now we can run this code. Okay. Now we can run this code. So you can see here, I have indeed modified the values inside the method, but in my caller context, the values are still the same. Why? We have taken a copy of the flags array and then we have passed it into the method. That is the reason the Caller context is not modified. So that is the main thing I wanted to show here. So to copy things are as simple as doing a square bracket dot dot. But remember, this is only a shallow copy. So we will not get into the, the discussion. What is a deep copy? But you can read about it later. So now let's come to list. So we looked at a byte array. Now look, let's look at an alternative way of storing this data structure. Where instead of byte array, we can treat it as a list. So the way to initialize a list is like this. Let me comment out this, we don't need it. So this is our initial byte array. And what we are doing with this byte array, let me comment out this also. What we are doing with this byte array, we are using a method called to list byte and we are converting it to a list of bytes. So this is nothing but a list of bytes. Right? This is the data type that L flags will be of. But we don't need to specify that explicitly. We can simply say var. Compiler will, will figure out based on the context that we are actually clear, creating a list of bytes. Now we can pass the same thing we do. We print out and then we call the set LSBs and then we print out. So let's uh, return from here to demonstrate how this works. So same thing uh, main and then. Uh, OK, before calling the, the function we are printing and here we are doing this and here we are doing this. So now the behavior is slightly different. Let's look at the code first because we can't interpret the results without looking at the what do you call the set lsp field so here you can see uh, set lsp yes yeah set lsp field so here we are taking this we are okay one more thing i didn't show you earlier for example here 
this is an array, right? This is a common uh, for loop for an array, but there is an easier for loop, which is for each. Everyone from other programming languages, you would have seen this. But when we try to do it this way, it gives a want error. So what it says cannot assign item because it is inside a for each context. Now the reason for this error is because uh, when you uh, loop through an array using a for each statement, the items are read only. You can't assign it. So this is a point which uh, uh, some of you may be knowing, but uh, I just wanted to bring it out. But in our case, this will not work. The reason is we are explicitly modifying it. That is the reason it doesn't work. So we have to use the for loop rather than for each because our requirement is to modify it inside the method. OK, so that is the reason. So let's come back to our uh, thing here. So actually, this is not something I wanted to show. OK. So you can see here we are calling the method where the data is modified and the modification is also seen in the caller. And again, the same concept as arrays, only thing it is an alternative data structure. So in the case of arrays, we learned how to make a copy. In the case of lists, we can make copies like this. So you create a new list of bytes and you pass the original list. And then now a copy is passed into the method and uh, the caller context, the uh, original copy is un untouched. So very simple. And uh, so now the question is, when would you use arrays and when would you use list? Anyone has an answer for this question? So for the example that we have shown, the same thing we can implement either as an array or as a list. So in what context should we use an array? In what context should we use a list? That is the question I want to put to the group. So, array is, some, so array is something where uh, similar data type we are getting and list is something where I have uh, uh, like different data types I can store. Uh, no, that is not the case in the case of C sharp. So if you're coming from other languages, let's say Python or uh, I, I think R also, there those kind of data types can store different uh, types of data within the same data structure. But here in C sharp, we are explicitly saying that this list can store only bytes. It can't store any other type. It can store so only- in that case, we can make it we can make it as a generic, right? So in that case, we can go for like any like string, integer, whatever it is. Yeah, you can make it, but in this example, uh, we are our requirement is only to store bytes. So now, uh, mm -hmm. but your answer is valid. So suppose you want a generic data type and if C sharp allows that, yes, you can do it. But let's say my requirement is only to store bytes. Very simple requirement. Why would I choose arrays over, over list or list over arrays? Okay, I agree, I agree with that. Yeah. Right. So the answer is simple. An array is something that is initialized once typically. Right. That is all the data that that required to be processed. They are all known in advance. Doesn't mean that you cannot add to the array or anything. Uh, so let's say flags dot, right? I think you can append to an array. So those things are possible. But uh, question is, typically arrays are used when you want to initialize it only once and use it. Whereas list is more dynamic data, uh, dynamic structure, where let's say all the data is not available upfront. So that is the example I've given here. When you start the array, you don't have any data. When you start the list, you don't have any data. Then later on, as you start processing from some other data structure, you start adding data to it. So this is the purpose of list, where is there all any the data is not available. Come again. Is there any uh, performance consideration in these two uh, data type selection? 
Uh, this is the consideration when when your data is kind of uh, not available at the beginning and it requires processing. Let's say you have to process get data from different sources and add the data dynamically. Then a list is a better data structure. So you add first this byte, then you add, then you got a range of bytes, you add that range. So then you end up with something similar to this. Whereas array is better if all the data is known in advance. So you can initialize it once and start using the array. So that way list is more dynamic. The other thing about array is when you allocate the array, the length of the array must be known in advance. So here when you allocate, you know, for example, eight bytes are needed. Here you don't know in advance how many bytes are needed. You don't know how many bytes are going, more bytes are going to come. So the allocation for list will change dynamically as more bytes are added or removed into the data structure. So this is more flexible. And another thing about array uh, uh, and another thing about list is that you can add anywhere in between. So for example, if I want to insert in the beginning, I can do that. I can do something like this. That means now this FF will be inserted in the beginning of the list and other things will follow. Although I am adding this, computing this, you know, only in line 26 already list has been initialized. I can go to a previous position and insert something. Which is not possible here. In arrays, you can't do that. Only in list, you can do that. So this one is a more flexible data structure. Compared to arrays. With that understanding, let's look at the last example here. Scores. So I have scores. And. Uh, I am pre allocating. This is what is known as pre allocation. See, uh, I told you earlier. That uh, the memory allocation for list will change dynamically as more elements are added. So here probably there are only two bytes allocated for the list for storage. But then as more bytes come in, it will increase dynamically. But the problem with this is every time you add, it will allocate, uh, reallocate or readjust the memory allocation. So that has a slight performance, hit, but it is not so bad as in arrays, reallocating uh, entire memory structure for arrays. That is what happens for arrays. So here memory allocation happens that also can be avoided by pre allocating. So here what we are doing is we are creating a new list called scores. And we are pre allocating in advance 10 bytes. Right, actually not 10 bytes. We are this is storing a list of integers. So we are allocating uh, 10 uh, placeholders to contain uh, 10 integers. That is what we are doing. And we know in, an integer takes four bytes. So basically we are pre allocating 40 bytes. And then what we are saying, so let's look at this. Let's do a printout of this and see what happens. So you can see here the capacity of the list is 10, but right now it doesn't contain any elements because why we have not initialized it. The way we initialized it, we have not initialized. So now what is the difference between this syntax here in line number 22? And the syntax here in line number 31, there is a very subtle difference. So what is happening is here we are initializing it, although there is nothing, no data is supplied. Whereas here we are not initializing it, but we are pre allocating the memory for 10 units, 10 items. But we can also initialize it by doing this. So now let's unravel this. What is happening? We are calling the constructor and we are pre allocating it for 10 items. After pre allocating for 10, we are initializing the first three to 112233. Now let's print out this, see the output that we get. So you can see here the capacity of the list is 10, but currently it contains three more items. What it means, we can add seven more items with, without any memory allocations. So that way, you know, it is more efficient because we are pre allocating. So we can also adjust the capacity. Right, so for example, we pre allocated 10, 
but we can change the capacity to five because maybe later in the program we realized we don't need 10, five is enough. So we can also do this. So as you can see here, initially capacity was 10, count was three. Then we pre uh, change the allocation. So capacity is reduced to five, count is still three. Right? What happens? Suppose I reduce the capacity below the number of elements. What will happen now? I have three elements already initialized in the list, but now I am telling the C, C sharp runtime that I want to reduce the capacity to two. What will happen? It will not work. Because now our list has three items. How can you force it to two items? How can you reduce the capacity? So now what C sharp will do, it will throw an exception, argument out of range exception. So you can't reduce the capacity below the number of items already in the list. So that is something we have to keep in mind. OK. Now, uh, yeah, this one I already covered how to insert in between. So this is the last example. Uh, I think I already ran it. So originally our list had three items. Then I am inserting 8899 at the start of the list. This is something you can't do with arrays. Arrays are more or less fixed. If you have eight elements, you will have eight elements. You can only change the values of the eight elements. Whereas in the case of list, it is more uh, memory efficient. Uh, operations are efficient. You can easily insert in between, insert at the end, insert at any position. And you can change the existing values as well. So that is the beauty of a list. Any questions? So we have come to the end of this project. So this thing is really about uh, lists and arrays. So uh, I have a question here. So in list, yeah. uh, we are pre-allocating, right? So now it's uh, five or ton, uh, 10. So in production, say, for example, I'm taking a random example. Yeah. We have uh, thousands of records, 10,000 of records. Yeah, dynamically, we'll allot the uh, memory. But runtime, we are not going to use that much of uh, data. So in that case, uh, it will be a um, bad practice, right? Yeah, so uh, you have to see it. Normally, people will not pre-allocate. If they have no clue how many uh, items will be actually coming in runtime. So they will simply, whatever is initialized, they will initialize. Then everything will be determined at runtime. They will not do any pre-allocation. So can, but, can we do like something we allocate it and runtime? Can we compress that? And if it is not used, like that is exactly this. That is exactly this example. See, initially okay. I expected it. It will be ten, but during the course of the program, I know that it has stabilized to under five. So I restrict the capacity to five. Okay, okay, right. makes sense. But yeah. this is only to show you the functionality, but actually nobody will do this. The reason is unless you have a memory problem, you will not release the capacity because already you have allocated. Why bother? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Right. Already you have allocated, so why bother with reallocating? See, uh, yes. your point is let's say this is a huge number like this, then it makes sense to reduce the capacity. You want to release the memory back to the heap. Correct. But if you yes. don't have any memory constraint, you don't need to bother with small amounts of memory. You can simply leave it at the initial capacity. 100 okay. bytes, 1000 bytes, it's uh, nothing for today's computing systems. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, next so, is. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Regarding my. First, first question, somehow I'm not uh, convinced. Uh, I agree with that, but value type and reference type, but how come now the dynamic object, it contains a list of values, and now how come it is playing as a value type when you're passing the argument there? So some, somewhere I'm not clear on that. Can you put uh, light, uh, more light on that? No, actually from the previous, uh, was it here that I covered value type? Okay. So actually, yes, so see. Yeah. See, Sorry, list of bytes, list of byte array or flags that we talked about, L flags. This is a reference type. OK, so mm -hmm. think of it in memory. Yeah. In memory, we mm -hmm. have. 
so let's say uh, how many we we have we allocated for eight bytes right so these eight bytes are stored in memory somewhere here okay so the val values contained in this are these values that we initialized whatever we initialized here they are stored in this particular location in memory doesn't matter what location it is let's say let's call it a in this location in memory these eight bytes are stored but now there is a separate memory to indicate where l flags is stored right so there is a sort of a reference to l flags so that is b the l flags is a reference so this uh, is referring to so this will be pointing kind of if i have to write diagrammatically l flags will be pointing to this location so now when you pass l flags to the method you are actually passing this reference which is the value of l flags so you are actually kind of passing the pointer which is pointing to this memory location that is what you are passing into the method okay <clears throat> right. no. yeah so that is what is happening so this mm -hmm. is the storage of the bytes but to keep track where this bytes is stored that is where l flags comes in okay so when we when we get the value you mean to say it is as a, a reference only but when we internally it is reference with a internally value. it is a reference to this location wherever no. this byte array is stored mm -hmm. so when we say pass by value we are passing the value of l flags but what is that value it is simply a pointer to this location Okay. That is why when you modify this, you are also modifying the context here. So if you don't want this modification, you have to take a copy. That is the point I wanted to make. Got it, Arun. Thank you so much. Now we come to the next project, which is this one. So we are already at eight. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, this one will not take much time. I hope. So this one. Uh, so let me show this code first. Span. This is very important to know. Now I don't know how many of you are working in the networking side. Any kind of networking side. Let's say you are dealing with TCP/IP protocol. So a server is listening to a socket. It is receiving a stream of bytes. likewise client client will receive a stream of bytes and if it's a protocol like tcp ip you have to decode those that byte stream from that byte stream you have to extract all the information so the ip header tcp header socket number port number destination ip address source address so there will be you know dozens of things to extract but everything finally comes to the server as a stream of bytes so now when it enters the c c sharp system uh, your code where you have to manipulate it you may represent it as a array of bytes so this is what you are getting so i am taking a simple example for this uh, session where we get a stream of bytes the first four bytes we know for certain it's fixed it's a header then all other bytes which is variable number of bytes that is the body of the message which is coming in what message what is the length of the message that is all given in the header according to the rules of the protocol whichever protocol you are following okay so this is our uh, requirement so now we already saw in the previous example how to use lists and arrays so we got some idea now we try to decode this uh, byte stream entering our system first we will decode the header and we know the header is four bytes so there is no point passing more than 4 bytes into the method everyone agrees because actually it is dangerous what if there is a bug here it will go and affect the body which is these bytes so good programming practices pass to a method only what that method requires only what is the concern of that method so here i am clearly saying my method is decoding only the header so i should pass only the first 4 bytes 
then in the next method i am saying decode only the body once i figure out the header i i will maybe i will give some type also what is the type of message which is coming in but for simplicity i am just passing these bytes to the uh, decode body so uh, this code i hope is very clear now now that we have already seen from the previous example what we are doing we are taking a slice of that buffer and we are saying from the beginning of the buffer take four bytes and pass it to decode header and decode body from index 4 that is 0 1 2 3 4 from index 4 to the end of the message pass it to decode body so very clear code nothing wrong here but this code can be improved let's run this code let's say let's see what happens uh build errors so no it failed the build so what happened here okay there is the exception what is so strange return okay decode body byte array that decoded ah it looks okay to me so let's uh, compile it again see what this wrong cannot open oh okay i changed the file name or something um access to path Oh, okay, it's the antivirus is doing something. Let me disable the antivirus. I think it is the antivirus. Yeah, it is an antivirus. Thought this is a suspicious. Uh, because you are so, manipulating bytes. Yeah, can you see the printout here? Decode header four bytes. Decode body six bytes. Okay, and if you look at the code, code is simple. we are simply saying from inside this two methods we are simply printing how many bytes so uh, our code is correct so in the decode header we are passing four bytes in the decode body we are passing the next six bytes how to improve this code firstly you can introduce something called a constant constant int you can also say unsigned int header length equal to 4 now instead of having a variable this will prevent me from making mistakes in future because i know that my header is always fixed to 4 bytes i don't want it to to be a variable and uh, later cause problems so now my header is fixed so this is a uh, smart use of or a proper use of the constant uh, modifier to a uh, variable so now my code is a little bit uh, better okay but nothing else has changed okay now what is the fault in this program can somebody say what is the problem everything is good this is what we wanted we wanted to pass four bytes into only four bytes into header and decode body we wanted to pass the next six bytes but what is the real problem in this program functionally there is no problem a tcp ip packet is uh, not a small packet right it can be 1500 yeah. bytes uh, i i think the decode body uh, there is no limit there is no limit but that because we have not implemented right so we can add those limits it is a valid point but uh, yeah so that your answer is uh, somewhat closer to what i am expecting see a tcp ip packet is like easily 1500 bytes at its max and uh, you can have probably have bigger packets also if you want i think so now what this two functions when we call these two functions we are doing this slicing which is bad 
in this context because what why it is bad we are taking a copy of the entire array do you agree so this is not very uh, smart pro programming yeah, it, will, it will lead to higher memory usage yeah definitely more memory usage and uh, this uh, this is all allocated on the heap and then it is passed to the method then after this uh, it returns then the garbage collector has to run to reclaim all that memory so now this is extra work on the c sharp runtime or dot net runtime so how to avoid this but the thing is we also don't want to pass the entire array the simple solution is to pass it like this but we don't want to do this because if you do this we are passing the entire header length it's already defined in this scope okay okay that's fine so the reason for that is when we do it like this we have a problem where you are passing the whole 10 bytes to both the methods which is also not what we want so the solution to this there are different solutions to this i will present one solution which is this all these things we already covered right so for this we will instead of using all this we will use a list this is another use case for a list so what we have here from this array we have now created a list right this is also not a great example but let's assume why this is not a great example because we are already having an array when you take a list obviously you are doing a copy here right so this is also not a great example but uh, for illustration let's assume that the data that is coming into our system is already uh, formatted as a list of bytes then this is a really good example now we will not be in a position where we have to take copies so we have this method called dot take this is coming from something called link so i will write it down what it is anyone has heard of this yes yes link so link is nothing but language integrated query so this comes from uh, uh, the way uh, c sharp interfaces with databases or typically any kind of data source where you can apply mysql like command language to process your data sources so that is exactly what is happening here so you take your list of bytes and you say dot take from this point onwards that means you skip the first four bytes and you from this uh, sorry you pass the first four bytes into decode header that is what this is saying same thing with the decode body here you can use a range take is powerful that it has a overloaded method either it can accept an integer or in this case it is accepting a range so in this case you are saying from position number 4 to the end of the list you pass it you take those number of those bytes and then you pass it to decode body okay so this is the link method which is a nice way to do it uh, so you can uh, go and look it up how it works but let's assume that we are not in a position to use this because for some reason we are stuck with array an array of bytes we can't use any list then what is the solution so there is a solution for that as well i deleted it so i am putting it back <clears throat> the solution is you use something called span of bytes so you take your buffer but instead of using it directly you define another data type called span of bytes as buff which is simply pointing it to buff now the beauty of span is it doesn't make any copies zero memory copy it is simply another reference and that too this is a reference which is not on the heap it is on the stack so it is simply taking this and pointing it to this buffer okay now you took take a slice this looks exactly like what we used to do with arrays same same syntax taking a slice in both the cases 
But now there is no memory copy which is being done. Why? Because now you are using a span of bytes. So now in this case, the decode header, it will call this function. It will no longer call this one. See, you know, in C sharp, you can have the same method name, but the method is overloaded. In the sense that the number of arguments are different or the type is different. In this case, they both have same number of arguments, but the type is different. If it's a byte array, this one will be called. But now we are not passing a byte array. We are using a span of bytes. So obviously this method will be called. So now this is the correct way to do memory efficient programming in C sharp because now no copy is made. Same thing for decode body, no copy is made. Right, and the syntax is exactly same. Nothing has changed. Right, so now let's run this. Same, four bytes passed to the decode header, six bytes passed to the decode body. Now, one more interesting thing here. Let's come here and let's say I want to change this zero FF. Okay. Now let's run this code. Will it work? It works, right? We, we did not do any printout, but we can do a printout if you want. So let's go back to our uh, thing here and here we can do a printout. Console dot right line and s of what zero zero only we change. So let's print it out. 255 we initialized it to 0x ff. So you can see you can also modify it from inside here, right? But when you are decoding from a byte buffer, let's say a TCP IP packet, do you really want to modify? The answer is no. We should not be, no one should be allowed to modify the incoming array. So the purpose of both these methods is only to decode, not to modify anything. So this should be read only. And this is the other beauty of span. There is another subtle variation of span called read only span. Now this is safe programming. Now even by mistake, you cannot, you will not be allowed to modify. See, already it throws an error. Because this is now a read only span, you cannot modify. It. Now, this is another beauty of span, which is hard to do with arrays. With arrays, you cannot get this read only behavior, even though, even though you may say, okay, I can live with uh, making a copy because I am not getting a very large packet from the network. So, I, I can afford to make a copy. Even if you do this, you cannot force the read only behavior with arrays. But with span, you get a benefit of both things. You can also make it read only and your zero copy is involved here. So this is one of the beauty of span uh, using spans. OK. <clears throat> Any questions at this point? So there is one more function, one more variation, which is called I enumerable, which I am not going to show because of lack of time, but uh, you will have this example in the code. You can take a look at it. So this is also as good as span. But span I feel is even better because you have this extra thing of read only. Okay. So now we come to the last example which is uh, object oriented programming. So I'll set this up as a startup project. And program. So here now I have three files. One is the main program file product and shopping cart. So obviously object oriented programming, you can expect classes. So I have defined a product. So product is defined by a unique ID price, discount, and then a bool, whether it is already sold or yet to be sold. OK. So how can anyone improve this? 
just by looking at this any improvement that comes to your mind anyone in this what items would be variables and what items should be fixed id should be fixed okay good price is also fixed because if there is a discount that is handled as a separate uh, item separate yeah. property of the class so to how do you fix it obviously you can't make it constant the reason you can't make it constant is if you make it constant you have to initialize here itself you have to initialize here but we don't get the initialization at this point because it's a generic it's a class only when the object is created you can initialize so you you can do something like read only but if it if it is read only how can you initialize it that question also comes so the answer uh, to that question is of course this is also read only answer to that question is read only doesn't mean that uh, you cannot initialize it at all read only only means that before the object is constructed it has to be initialized what does it mean before so this is a constructor for this class so before the constructor exits you have to initialize the read only properties of this object so now we have two properties id and price before this constructor exits you have to initialize afterwards you cannot initialize that is the point right so this is how it is now if you run this you cannot initialize price later on because at run time it will complain you have to initialize it now itself and the discount and uh, the other uh, properties they are not read only so they can be initialized later as well so let's go to our program this is our program very simple program let's run it so we are calling the constructor and when you are calling we are passing id and price so when the constructor exits the product is already initialized the read only fields are all initialized so let's run this uh, so see here i was trying to demonstrate what will happen if you try to initialize so like i said you can't initialize price later on once the object is already constructed e2 does not exist okay this is a, this is an example we'll come to it later so you can see here id is 10 price is 100 discount this we did not initialize discount 0 is sold false okay how is it that i am getting such a nice print out because i defined a new method here as part of my class which says to string so in my program all i have to do is write line product automatically it will create uh, represent it properly suppose i don't do this suppose i change the name right i change the name it, now it's still a valid method but now let's say if i run this program what will happen see it is now doing a print out but it is doing a print out which is generic coming from the dot net or c sharp library oop which is the name of the uh, name space of project and then the name of the class this is what it is printing but this print out is not very useful for us what we want is some useful information about the object and for that reason only we created this two string two string already exists in the base class right everything derives from a certain base class so here you get a warning that there is already a inherited member from the base class so to avoid this warning we have to explicitly say we want to override the base class method then the warning will disappear now if you do a print this two string method will be called not the method which is defined in the base class which simply says oop dot product right that is that print out is coming from a, a base class from dot net library so that is overridden by our own custom implementation for this class where we give more useful information 
ID, price, discount, sold. So always keep in mind when you define new classes, don't forget to override the base class to string method to give useful printout about what your object contains. So that is one of the tips that I can tell. So now after, you know, kind of in constructing, you can change the other parameters. So for example, if I return from here, See, initially there was no discount, then I introduced a discount of 10. Because discount is not a read only property. You can read and write, so you are we are able to modify it. Now we create another prop product. So here, what did I do? If you see clearly, I constructed the object. Then later on, I changed the, some of the other properties of the object. But you can do all this one shot using this, which we have seen in a previous example. If you remember the list of uh, bytes, this is basically the initialization part. This is the constructor part. So what we are doing, we are constructing the object with the read-only properties. Then afterwards, as a shortcut, we are initializing the non-read-only properties here. This also we can initialize it through a constructor. If you add more parameters to the constructor, you can do it. But here I just wanted to show how it can be done. Initialization in C sharp is as elegant as this. Right? If you don't do it this way, you have to do it this way. That is product dot discount is equal to 55. Product dot is sold is equal to false. Right. You can do it like this also. But there is an elegant way in C sharp, which is you can do it like this. So that is the point I wanted to show here. Everyone following? Okay. Yes, so yes. now we go ahead. Any question at this point? No, I just said uh, yes, we are following on that. Okay, okay. Now last example. I introduced one more class called shopping cart. Shopping cart has two properties. One is the total price. And then list of products. Very simple. And we are initializing it also. But when we initialize it. It is initialized to an empty list, so nothing wrong with that. Then we are in introducing a method called get product. So uh, this is nothing but an index not ID of the product, I would say it is an index. Right? So we give an index and then from this list, it will, whatever index is given, it will retrieve that product. And like the other class here also, we are putting a useful two string. What is the total price and what is the number of products that are there in this shopping cart? So very simple class. Let's see how we are using it in the program. So let's come back to here. Remove this return. We don't need this. So we have the shopping cart here. And we have a printout for the shopping cart. So this will come to these things later on. OK. So now you see how elegantly I am able to initialize the entire shopping cart. Because I'm assuming that everything is known in advance. So I'm doing it like this. So I create a new shopping cart. And then I know that one of the members or properties of the shopping cart is product, which is nothing but a list of product. And each product I'm creating it like this. We saw that earlier. Read only properties are uh, given to the constructor. Then the discount is also initialized here. So I am now having a shopping cart with three items. And let me print it out. So this is it. So I am having a total price zero and number of products is three. Why is total price zero? Because when I construct the shopping cart like this, I have not added any logic here to update the total price. Got it? So maybe I can create one more method like this add product. Right. And here I can say 
product PDT. And what, what is this adding going to do? It will go to products. And it will add the product to that list. And after adding, I will update the total price. So I can do something like price is equal to plus equals product dot price. Right. But to make this work, I have to initialize this to zero. Anyway, it will be zero, but this is how it can be done. Add product. You can say void. It doesn't return anything. So I hope you are following this example. Right. But unfortunately, this is not a foolproof method. This will work if you are adding it like this, but now we are not adding it like this. Instead, we are initializing the entire shopping cart like this. So when you do this, the add method is bypassed. So you can uh, introduce kind of uh, something like this update total price. This can also be done. So we can create a new method which will update the total price. Right? I hope you understand. So this what it will do. You can quickly implement this also update total price. So very simple public. Void update total price. It doesn't need to take anything input and. Uh, for now here we can use for each. Product in products see. And then you can say total price plus equals product dot price. That's it. Now you have to put a var. Right. So now this will give us give us an updated value of total price. So now if you run, what will happen? See the price is properly updated 450. Right. Because how did we initialize? We said 100, 200, and 150. So the total price is 450. So I just showed you this as an example. So here, the way it is done is. When price is, price is uh, computed or up updated using this function, and then you know the uh, thing will be valid. But there is a problem with this kind of implementation. What if you forget to update the call this function? Right? Then the only way is uh, people should be allowed to add only through this interface. They should not be allowed to add directly through the list. So for that to happen, you should make this private. And you should only allow people to add to the product through this public interface. That is the way to do it. But I, so th those are all uh, some extra things about object oriented programming. So we will not get into that now. So let's go back to the original code. It was like this. Now there is another way to extract the total price on a when people call total price, that time we compute the Total. The way to do it is something called get set. Some of you might have heard of this getters and setters. So I'm showing you an example here. Okay. So total price, when somebody tries to read this value, at that point, this get getter method, so it's called a method. Uh, so basically, it's a bunch of uh, processing steps statements. So this will execute. So what it will do, it will create a local variable, assign it to some, uh, assign, initialize it to zero. And exactly what we did earlier for each, update the sum and return the sum. So now the difference between this implementation and the previous method is that this is computed only when the total is required. But it has the disadvantage that it will run every time you try to access the total price. So we have not updated the price anywhere, but when you try to access it here, it will give you the correct price because at that time it will compute the total. So let's run this. Some failure somewhere. What did you say? 
So here we introduce this, we removed it. So that's why. So now you see we get the same result total price 450 number of products 3. How did it work? Even though we did not explicitly compute any total, because now we introduced a getter method for this property. So when somebody tries to read the value, that time it will compute that. Okay. But now there is a much, so this is easily understood, but now there is a much simpler shortcut for this, which I will show you now. That whole thing can be reduced to a single line. Same for same behavior. What we do products dot sum. And then we take each product. And we say. P dot price. So basically for each product, we are computing the sum on price. That is the interpretation of this. And we return the whole thing as an unsigned int because some returns long, as you can see here, some returns long, but we have defined this as unsigned int. So we have to cast it to unsigned int. So how is this syntax different from what we saw previously in the for loop? This is the link syntax. So we show, I showed you earlier L I N Q. So imagine a database column. This is exactly what you would do. You would sum all the entries in that column. To get the total price of that shopping cart. That is exactly what is happening here. So this is a much more readable uh, way of uh, writing code. So if you are into link kind of syntax, then this may be something that you may start using more and more if you get used to it. OK, so let's go back to the last thing in this program. So, so far when we execute our code, we are only getting total price and products for the product uh, for the shopping cart. What if I want to know all the details of the products inside the shopping cart? So to do that, I have to go and update here. It's a bit troublesome, right? I have to go to shopping cart. I have this two string here. So here I can create a more complex string representation of the shopping cart where for each product I get the string and then I format it and give a nice presentation. Right, I can do that so I can make this more complex to give a nice printout of my shopping cart. But there is an easier way and that is you may mark the entire class as serializable. And after making it serializable, you use. A third party library like Newton soft JSON. So now you represent the entire object as a JSON serialized object, and that is exactly what we are doing here. If you see this code, we take our object shopping cart, which is here. <coughs> we take our shopping cart and format it in with some indentation. We get a string, we pass it to right line. Let's run this. Now you see we get a very nice printout of the entire shopping cart. All the products, total price, and details of the products as well. Right? So this, so instead of bothering with the up upgrading or updating our two string method to something more complex, we can simply make use of third party libraries and the serialization and JSON serialization. So this is it's as simple as this. Right? Last thing. Get product. Suppose you want to print one particular product. We already saw this method. What we do in this method. This is all we do. So this is another way to do it. So to get one particular product, you can do this. So this is the printout which came from there. But there is a shortcut for this as well. And the shortcut is like this. This is called as an indexer. So the shopping cart. Let's assume that for some reason. You don't even need this method. You can, I mean, it's equivalent to this. But there is a shortcut which you can do. So this is called as an indexer. So what it returns is the same. It returns a specific product with a given index. Let's say IDX, we call it be consistent with this method. 
But instead of marking it like this, we use the this pointer and this square bracket. At that specific location, you get this particular. You execute this. So what this allows us to do is we can use our object as if it's an array. So by doing this, it is understood that we are trying to get the first product in our shopping cart. So this is one particular use case where indexer makes sense. So this is a very another handy shortcut which is available in C sharp. So thanks for uh, so this is the last example I had. Any questions? We have come to the end of the presentation. So C sharp is a kind of old language, not so old as C, but uh, of course it has learned from the experience of C and it has tried to correct many things. So we saw uh, nullable as an example of that. So nullable helps you to avoid null pointer references or segmentation faults. Then we looked at uh, arrays and lists, where to use arrays, where to use lists. So arrays typically when all your data is known in advance, you use arrays. Lists when your data is dynamic, you use lists. Then we looked at span. It can help you to write more memory efficient code. The beauty of span is it involves zero copy. No copy of your input is involved and you can pass it around freely. Then lastly, we looked at uh, some object oriented concepts where we looked at the difference between uh, read only and constant. Then we looked at uh, how to use uh, how to initialize objects. So read only's can be initialized through the constructor. Then other properties can be initialized either through the constructor or outside as well. So there is a very simple syntax for that. We also looked at getter as an example. Where the value is computed dynamically at the point of requesting it. Finally, we looked at how to print out the object. You can either Override the default uh, two string method, or you can use JSON serialization. So that's all I had to share. I hope you found this useful. Any feedback? I think yeah, it was very, very useful. Okay, so Vijay, uh, yeah, thank you for that. You are you are very interactive, but others uh, were very silent. If you have questions, uh, it would have been more interesting. You can ask now if you have any questions. So uh, basically, uh, like, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mishra, Padmanabh and Mishra. Yeah, so the I have a question. Like, uh, there is a lot of improvement happening in the uh, C sharp also. So like, uh, although I'm new to uh, C sharp, uh, but I got interested into it. There are new things which are coming up. Uh, I think there is a lot of enhancement in terms of nullability uh, checks. And uh, maybe in the sharp it has become by default you cannot have anything null. It will start giving error or or warning or something like that. And uh, they have introduced new types also like class uh, value type and then uh, so reference type value type and then they have introduced record also so yeah, yeah. Uh, so can you like uh, help us understand those things uh, no we don't have time but uh, briefly i introduce value type and reference type but uh, this is something you can read up there are enough uh, references out there to help you to i think uh, I think maybe I will put an example before releasing the code. I'll put an example so that you get an understanding. Thank you. Yeah. That is very basic. You have to. It is a good question. You have to understand value type and reference type. Without that understanding, you will not be proficient in C sharp. And your earlier point about a lot of improvements happening in C sharp, uh, obviously, uh, C sharp uh, is a popular language. We saw that it's among the top five. So naturally there is a lot of interest among programmers. Uh, so they keep uh, updating the language. 
every year there is a release both for c sharp as well as dotnet and typically these uh, releases happen in november but now already the preview is out for uh, the next version so the formal release will happen in november but already now we are in march already uh, .NET 8 previews uh, has come out so they are continuously updating their system updating both the .NET as well as c sharp capabilities any other questions vijay you are asking something yeah so my was my question was around like uh, any upcoming sessions regarding uh, threading multi threading uh, delegates because those were the interesting uh, topics and any practical sessions or like uh, it will be great helpful yeah we can any? do it uh, no doubt uh, yeah. so if there is more interest in the community we can do it we, uh, we were also thinking of a uh, what do you call that dot uh, net moi workshop oh okay to build a cross platform uh, mobile app so already trainer is available we are looking for a venue so if anyone oh. has a venue we can arrange that it will be a half a day workshop hands on fully hands on so oh. if you are working in a company and if your company can sponsor the venue that will be great we can quickly organize that otherwise uh, we have exactly. to wait till a venue becomes available yeah, I know one of the group member is there already uh, with me. Like I can talk to him and get it done because venues and all he's arranging. Maybe sure, I can sure. talk to him sure. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, more specifically to answer your question, uh, today's session was targeted at beginners. That's why we didn't go into other things like delegates, threading and all that. Uh, those will be specific sessions uh, targeted at those features of C Sharp or .NET. Yes, uh, it's a actually, ocean. It's a ocean, right? There are so many things in that language. Correct, correct. So, so we just touched upon the real basics. Yes. Like uh, after the some uh, longer period of time, right? Uh, some basics uh, <laughs> will be uh, ruined out. Means we'll be forgetting some of the things. But yeah, refresher is very good. Even I follow Shuprasad Kerala, so he he will explain like reference type, value type. And you, even how uh, uh, how basic understanding like there there will be a lot of confusions on it. Okay, we understand something, but basically it acts like a different way. So mm -hmm. that kind of things are there. But by brainstorming and discussion like this, it is very interesting, and we'll get a lot of clarity on this. Mm -hmm. And thanks, uh, Arvind. Yeah, I'll, uh, we'll start close with this example, if you can see. Since we were talking about uh, reference type, value type, I have not tried this example, but uh, let's take a look at this. I have initialized it to one, okay? And then I say increment i. Increment i. And then I say print i. Console, right line i. And then I return from here. Now increment, I will create This is obviously passing by value, right? Here you are incrementing. Yes, and we, we can print here also. I. Increment. So why it is kind of starting static. Okay, so let's see what is the printout we get here. So inside the method it incremented and then it came out. And uh, outside the method it is one. Why? Because this is a value type. Right, it is passing by value one that is getting incremented, but the original value in this context is still one that is not incremented. Okay, everyone following? Yes. So now yes. what I will do, I will mark this as ref int, right? And here must be passed with the ref keyword. 
only two places I have changed this code. Same code. Before calling, uh, first I change this method saying that now instead of int i, it takes ref int i. And here when I'm calling, I say explicitly ref i. Now let's run it. You see both are two. What is happening? Because by default it is passing by value. If you want to pass by reference, you have to explicitly tell I want to pass by reference by doing this ref ref. You understood now? Yeah, makes sense. So, Arvind. Right. So you can like this. There are so many examples, basic examples to help you understand passing by value and passing by reference. Since uh, Mishra also asked this question, I thought I'll share it with you. 